Hello and welcome to your Friday edition of Collider Movie Talk. On today's show, we're discussing the brand new Space Invaders movie just announced. And then on top of that, The Haunting of Hill House star Oliver Jackson Cohn scored the lead role in the Invisible Man movie. And then that's not even all. We're going to three stories today. Actually, we're going to four and I'll get to that later. But the other big story we have to cover up top is a Bond 25 announcement. Apparently, Christoph Waltz is going to return. And I get to talk about those topics today with Terry Schwartz. Is this your movie talk debut? It is. It is my movie talk debut. Oh my I'm God, this very is crazy. Excited. And it's funny too because I live so close to here but work so far away. So thank you so much for, for having me on the show. <laughs> I'm um, glad I'm it finally worked out. And Silas, as always, I am so happy when you come on the show. I wish I had a rhyming name though. Like I wish I was Larry or Gary. Or <laughs> I mean, Barry. you could you could be like Jerry today if you want, but with an I. There's, yeah. there's no way to even turn your name into a nickname. Like we were just completely <laughs> hopeless in that sector. Silas. Silas. <laughs> There's something fun to that too. I'm yes. going to take it for today. All right. So as I said, up top today, we are talking Bond 25. So there have been rumors out there that Blofeld would return in Bond 25. But today in a somewhat official-ish capacity, it's pretty much seeming like it's the real deal, like he's going to be back. The way this news broke is that The Guardian first reported that Blofeld would return, but then it was The Playlist who added a little more more to the story that outlet says the character is going to function a bit like Hannibal Lecter in Bond 25 in that Leah Sadu's character pulls a Clarice Starling and visits Blofeld in prison hoping to mine him for information about the film's main villain who of course is being played by Rami Malek just in case you didn't know Bond 25 is hitting theaters on April 8th 2020 in the U.S. so you guys hear this movie. What do you hear this news about the movie? What do you think about the new details? Because when I first heard that Christoph Waltz was going to be back, I love Christoph Waltz. Spectre was not my favorite. Blofeld in that movie was not my favorite. I was like, eh, I don't know if I really need that. Then I hear the Hannibal Lecter details and that completely changed my tune. Are you into it? No. <laughs> uh, and and the reason is, uh, I think I, I just have an association with Star Trek Into Darkness. Like the twist was exactly the same in Spectre where it's like, I'm really a villain the fans have heard of, but that has no effect on the actual plot of the movie in any way whatsoever. Right. And this just reminds me again of like, oh, he's teaming up with him like in Star Trek Into Darkness. I can understand that. Yeah, it is. It's a little difficult to kind of pave the way after what it was in Spectre, which is probably why I was lukewarm on the idea to begin with. I, know, I have like, you know, we love Casino Royale like there were other really exciting Bond movies I have just no deep thought or attachment or anything around Spectre uh, or Christoph Waltz performance there then it, that being said like if this really is going to be presumably Daniel Craig's last Bond movie mm -hmm. uh, I know every time he says it's the last one it feels like he's finally getting to the point that that would happen it seems like the right time and an interesting way to bring it back but I agree that it's like it's a familiar trope at this point for these long running franchises to get a second stab at a villain. In this well, actually, film. bringing up that this is probably his last Bond movie, I, uh, hopefully it's a there's a story point to this, but what is the point as far as the franchise goes with connecting films like this? Because it's not like they can plant the seed for Blofeld to always exist in this same form in all the movies. So, I mean, is there any, is there any franchise value to this? Yeah, I think because you can have Christoph Waltz potentially stick around. Um, you could have him continue on as Blofeld. Um, and I, I just kind of wish he had a chance to be a full-fledged Blofeld first. And maybe use right. him as like connective tissue, but like in a more you know, supporting character role yeah, type thing. Yeah, we saw Blofeld return throughout yeah. the older Bonds. Um, I, I feel like he is a, a, a part of the franchise uh, so I, I could see rebooting and bringing him back. We got it with uh, Judy Dench, for instance. That's true. That's over. true. I do think, again, like the, this whole Hannibal Lecter premise, like you said, like that's the part that to me makes it more interesting because I think he could have a relatively small but effective role in the movie. Like you, they don't need to overuse him if he's mm -hmm. going to be a resource that they go to in a similar way as they're tracking down a bigger a villain. And again, like maybe it does get closer to a version that people will respond a bit more to instead of as you said, kind of like going the route of trying to subvert fan expectations uh, and then ultimately giving them exactly whatever and guess, but in a less exciting way. I'm also very into the idea of uh, Leah Sadu being in the Clarice role too. I like that yeah. idea, but one way or the other, 
how much screen time do you think he's actually going to get in this movie? Because I read a report like this and I'm like, oh, there's probably going to be one long sequence with the two of them where he (laughs) feeds her the information and then he's gone anyway. Do you see it any other way? I mean, it could be that this is Blofeld's plan for getting out of prison and that he's actually the big bad and has set everything in motion so they would come to him thinking that he can serve an Hannibal Lecter role. That seems reasonable. The The name is escaping me. The villain in uh, the last two Mission Impossible movies. Oh, um... I can't believe I can't remember his name right now, but... Someone, I'm sure, certainly does out there. He's like messaging that, that was one of those things, though, where they brought him back, and I'm right. like, oh, he's going to have a small role in the movie, and then he didn't. He had a much right. bigger role. Yeah, I mean, I, like, the cynic in me makes me think uh, big paycheck, uh, small shooting schedule, but I think it you could do as you're saying and he could shoot over a small period of time but kind of be a character who pops up a couple different places or maybe as you said like there's a reveal towards the end that this is part of a a master plan I think obviously I'm personally more excited about the prospect of Rami Malek being the villain in this movie and I Mm -hmm. hope that isn't like secretly a secondary villain to Blofeld because again I feel like we've seen that there is no way I'm actually glad you brought that up because I think that that kind of obliterates the idea of oh it's really Blofeld's story again because you don't care Cast Rami Malek, especially after his run with Bohemian Rhapsody, and then do that to him. Hopefully, seems unlikely. Anyway, <laughs> the, the villain I was trying to think of was uh, Sean Harris's character Lane in uh, the Mission Impossible franchise. Moving on, though, because we have this is kind of like a one-two punch of a story we're hitting right now. So there's going to be two bits to this: the Space Invaders part and then the Mortal Kombat part. First up, Space Invaders. So according to Deadline today, New Line is gearing up for a Space Invaders movie. Warner Brothers bought the rights to the game several years ago, and now New Line just hired Greg Russo to write the script after he already wrote the script for the Mortal Kombat reboot. So. We know the game. We played the game. Is there any possible way for them to stretch that game into a story worthy of a full feature? I think sure. <laughs> I mean, all you need is is aliens invading from space. Um, Perry, they made an emojis movie. <laughs> oh, you had to bring back that into my mind. See, that had. I still maintain that that had potential. I still think there was a there was a smarter, richer way to show how we use emojis and how they they can influence us. And it was just it, it, like that movie turned out to be exactly what one would think it would be at the most basic, boring, dull level. Right. And. I don't know. With with this, I mean, I'll let you bring up the point you brought up before because now I can't get that out of my head. <laughs> like, like, to your point, like, can they stretch it out? It's called Space Invaders. Like, it could be any small or large, flimsy or rich version of a space invasion story and it's staying true to that title. But, you know, I think when I when I think of Space Invaders, I think of the the alien icon, like the the super, you know, simple graphics and everything and, and colors because I think it's been re-envisioned so many times so when I first heard this news I thought of one of two things I thought (laughs) it could go the route of like a really interesting animated version which I know it it isn't explicit and we think it probably means live action but they could do a really cool interesting animated version of this I'm picturing something like the Lego movie where it's really inventive and playful with with using those graphics we're familiar with or I could see them going the route of pixels which made Perry Mm. just immediately keel over (laughs) and fall out of her uh, chair mentally yet another idea that I thought was super cool and then they just drove the whole thing into the ground. But that, that is kind of what I'm picturing. And I think that kind of just connects to the, the first question that I brought up because it's, it's one thing to say you're making a Space Invaders movie. And it's like you could do anything with alien and aliens invading and say it's Space Invaders. Right. But unless you have that, like, that iconic look of them coming down in lines like that, does it have to be a Space Invaders movie at all? Exactly. Or just make an alien invasion yeah. movie. <laughs> it's kind of the, one of those weird things where like uh, originality sort of eats itself because <laughs> yeah, the idea of making a Space Invaders movie because everybody knows it as a, as a title is silly, but at the same time you're kind of forced to do something original just by virtue of the fact that there's not that much there. I do. I've, the thought of Rampage right now is giving me hope because that that is also another game. I mean, that had a little more meat to its bones story-wise right. than this does, but that was another thing where I'm like, how exactly do you expand that into a full feature and keep me invested? And they wound up doing it and really capturing the style of the game in the third act too. So I guess that kind of bodes well for this a little bit. Silas, you also mentioned Battleship earlier, which I think is another adaptation of like a relatively simple concept where it's like you have that, you have the thing in the headline, what are you going to do with it? Um, but I'm curious, like, 
I already mentioned to me that like the 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 shape of the Space Invaders mm-hmm. is kind of like and the design of the game are the most iconic elements. But I'm curious, like, what do you guys think are the other iconic elements that they would have to get? Right, I guess it's like the formation yeah. of attack. I think I think it is formation more Especially so than like anything. Because <laughs> that that's like the style. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I really do think of of uh, Independence Day too, and even the 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 line about formation and yeah. the way the way they kind of zip around. But I feel like that is the only, or at least from my memory, at least the right. only defining feature of the game. Unless right. there's something that I missed. <laughs> I, I, I want the moment where, you know, you can get behind the barricade and then you can make like a, a thin hole to shoot through. You got so, so you much farther in Space Invaders space than invaders. I have ever had. <laughs> I want that scene represented in a film. Well, yeah. I'm curious to see if they actually pull it off. Before we get Space Invaders, we are going to get Mortal Kombat, though, because that one is much further along than this one. And we've got two Mortal Kombat updates for you that are very exciting. So the first one, speaking of Mortal Kombat, the Hollywood Reporter recently broke the news that the Raid star Joe Taslam has been cast as Sub-Zero. I love that casting. And then Simon McCoy is uh, directing the movie. James Wan is producing. And then the guy that we were talking about before that's writing the Space Space Invaders script uh russo he tweeted that since it's already been stated by other members of the team i'm gonna put this one to bed mortal kombat will be r-rated and for the first time ever fatalities will finally be on the big screen and no i'm not gonna say which ones you'll just have to wait for the movie and see with a little winky face emoticon. So Joe Taslam, and on top of that, confirmation that this is going to be an R-rated movie with fatalities on the big screen. Does that make you guys excited or more excited than you might have been for a Mortal Kombat reboot? Yeah, I mean, it's like, could you imagine if they were like, that's right, we're doing a PG-13 Mortal Kombat it's it's completely missing the point of that franchise, and if you're going to adapt that franchise, and then to catch cast someone like him who has Oof, such yeah. just a, a pedigree of amazing action and, and martial arts chops, like it, it seems like a no brainer in retrospect. It seems like a no brainer, but if they had said PG thirteen, I can't say I'd be all that surprised right. when we had two PG thirteen ones before, and then right. on top of that, it's just like it's the money issue. It's I hope they are spending responsibly with the rating in mind because usually when you get something that should be rated R and it's rated PG-13, it's so you can make more money at the box office and I can't really say I would blame a studio for going that route, but R rating suits this material so much better (laughs) and it does get me more excited to hear this reiterated. I just, I also like that it it makes it a bit more weird. Like the fatalities are such a strange part of of Mortal Kombat. And then there's also like the, where you turn people into babies and and whatnot. Like I'd like to see that weird, weird level of like violent magic, I guess. I'm, no, I'm into the weird stuff too. I wouldn't mind seeing them go that route. This is quite the ambitious project for that director, too. I'm very curious to see what he winds up pulling off and how James Wan can kind of help steer the ship or or just lend his expertise to him a little bit because James Wan is also known for that. He has kind of helped along new directors all over the place, so I hope that extends to this as well. And I think you've seen him really double down on what fans want, too. Like, you think of how different his horror work is compared to Aquaman, which was, like, so colorful and and splashy and pun intended and and had all these just crazy elements that didn't seem like they could work together but I would say did work together really well and so I think with that like backbone of he understands what fans will want from a franchise and how to work backwards from that to create a movie that delivers on that. Mm -hmm. I think both of these news bits uh, align and I'm very curious to see where the rest of the casting goes as well. Uh, When you start like this, you immediately put the entire raid cast, the night comes for us (laughs) cast, like everyone in the back of my mind. And it's, you know, I just saw Stuber, which had Eko Awais in it. And he, he's so good. I don't even care if there's no role that like suits him better than whoever else they're right. looking at right now. Like put him in every movie, every movie with action, please. And there's like a way to go for the, the flashy Hollywood name that, you know, you can like train them to mm-hmm. fight that way, but it's not really convincing. And then there's a way to go for the actors who just have that pedigree already and will earn you respect from the fans who will deeply care about mm-hmm. this. The fact that you're going that route. And I think I'm excited and heartened mm-hmm. that they're doing that. I like the fact that we're hopeful about these. <laughs> it would also just be cool. I mean, the, seeing how the conjuring universe has been built up. Yeah. Mortal Kombat is 
is filled with these like bigger than life colorful characters. Crazy that, lore, too. Yeah, like I, I, if the movie's good, I, I'm happy to see spinoffs about Baraka and whatnot. Right. right. I would not argue with that. Give me one good movie first because we'll probably <laughs> tackle a story in the live chat where they put the cart before the horse and announced a million movies before they made one that was successful. We'll get to that, though. Right now, we have to tell you about some future shows coming to Collider. And, of course, it's Friday, which means tomorrow, Saturday, then it's Sunday, so you get Weekend Mailbag with John Roca. Check it out. Hey everyone, John Roca here, the host of Collider Mailbag. A new episode drops every Saturday and Sunday in your face and in your ears, answering the questions from you fans about the world of entertainment, film, and television. Me and great guests from our sphere do the best to answer your questions from Twitter, from Instagram, and of course, email as well, every Saturday and Sunday. You know what next week is? comic-con week so we are going to have so much coverage for you on the main channel but also i must remind you if you are in town in san diego for the event there will be a collider panel on sunday you can check out all the information on the screen right now sunday the 21st at 12 30 p.m we're going to be in room 6 de be sure to come visit us we can say hi we can talk movies it'll be a great time and then on top of that another really cool graphic for you right now the cobra kai panel Come check me out hosting this <laughs> panel. I, this is still so weird. I can't keep it together when I talk about this. In Ballroom 20 on Thursday at 4.45, I get to moderate the Cobra Guy panel. I, I can't. I just can't right now. But hopefully I can the day of. Otherwise, that would be weird. <laughs> now we are going to hit our last story for the day. This is another exciting one. So Blumhouse has officially found its leading man for the Invisible uh, Man remake, according to Deadline. Haunting of Hill House star Oliver Jackson Cohen. He scored the title role in the movie, which is said to be a new twist on the classic story. It's Lee Whannell who is in to write, direct, and executive produce this remake. And it's already got Elizabeth Moss attached as well. Oliver Jackson Cohen. First off, what do you guys think about him taking this role, especially when we've kind of built a little bit of an impression on a new Invisible Man remake thanks to the dark universe that is no longer with Johnny Depp? <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's just funny to think of like re recasting an Invisible Man. It's just a strange idea. <laughs> um, but I I'm really happy. I like that he's not a big name mm -hmm. but I loved Haunting of Hill House I loved it so much honestly like this casting news just made me think of Haunting of Hill House which just made me happy because that show is so fantastic yeah and, like good for him and he <laughs> was he was really I think the entire ensemble in that show is great mm -hmm. but it's when I go to the first two names that gets me get me really hyped for that show it's Oliver Jackson Cohen and Victoria Pedretti, who's also going on to do really big things right now. So this is a great, great get for them, especially when we take the dark universe. And hey, you know, I was actually making this joke now that I say it for another movie that we're going to get to in a minute. <laughs> but they also put the cart before the horse as well. But they were going to go, you know, the big budget route like they did with the mummy. It blew up in their faces. But now it's over at Blumhouse. And not only does it make sense for them to you know spend a little more wisely, but I imagine casting someone who's still building their resume right now is a smart move for the production overall especially someone as talented as him it's also just like a fun like invisible man is probably my favorite of the universal monsters mm -hmm. uh, just because i sort of have more of a sci-fi tinge to my fandom and it's a classic sci-fi story that i'm not sure we have ever seen done as well as the original uh from the 30s uh with with claude rains like that the special effects in that movie hold up really really well well, that's a fair statement. I, it's interesting you bring up special effects. I think I had the quote. Yeah, I do have the quote here. Because Jason Blum was saying um, it was like the Blumhouse version of The Invisible. He's talking about the pitch that he got. It's a lower budget movie. It's not dependent on special effects, CGI, stunts. It's super character driven. It's really compelling. It's thrilling. It's edgy. It feels new. Does that kind of give you any uh, pause given how you feel about the original? I, I guess the only thing that I would be a little worried about is uh, I, I really like, for instance, Paul Verhoeven's Hollow Man, but it's so limited in scope. It's like everything is confined to a small area. I, I don't mind a small story uh, uh, about the Invisible Man, but I don't want to see it. I don't want it to feel like it's it's small on purpose. 
I feel like Blumhouse of all studios, they're good with like using a little and making it feel like a lot. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I would imagine Jason's comment was tied to The Mummy, which, you know, you you look Mm -hmm. back at that uh, now so ill-fated cast photo of the Universal, uh, you know, Dark Universe reboot. And you're like, oh, well, what could have been? And clearly what they went for with that were big names and they didn't deliver. I just, sorry, anyone who liked that Mummy reboot, I just thought it was so drab and missed the point. And and just wasn't a, a fun thing or a scary thing. Like well, it didn't it didn't hit either of kind of those recent or older mummy um, sentiments that it I just had. Got so I th- too far ahead of itself. Yeah, it's like it started to lose all its charm when it started to include the things that were teeing up the future. When I was semi enjoying being in the present. Don't forget the lesson of Iron Man. Have a good first movie before you put the cart before the horse. There you go. And so I think uh, with this one, I am excited about the the caliber of talent that they're bringing on for it. Like, I love Elizabeth Moss. I think she's a fantastic actor. Oliver really impressed me mm-hmm. uh, from Haunting of Hill House and I thought brought like this really conflicted performance as Luke in that show and like this this darkness and this weight to the role that I think will be really interested to see. I, I'm assuming that was kind of his calling card for why they were like, hey, you yeah. could be good here. Um, but I think the focus on 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 a quality uh, talent quality story over like big flashy special effects that may or may mm-hmm. not work like we saw in the mummy which I just again I was not impressed by that movie I think it's the right yeah. way to go and like lay the groundwork make yeah. a good first movie it doesn't need to be big and massive and universe starting and it's also worth bringing up upgrade Absolutely. this is his upgrade yeah. follow-up look yeah. at what he did with that i does that feel like it's got the scale and scope that you would hope to see in a movie like this that's a movie that by all technical measurements is a small movie and it doesn't feel small. Yes. It feels big. The special effects. I mean, it was so weird having Upgrade come out the same time Venom was out because they're very, very similar stories. And Upgrade blows Venom out of the water. I mean, it, it's insane because Venom's a fairly big budget movie. Right. Uh, but Upgrade does so much with, I, I wouldn't even say so little because it never feels like they're, mm-hmm. they're pushing. I never want to take away from movies that have the luxury of having the big budget and they use it well, but... When you have that pressure to make the most of very little, I always feel like that's where, you know, the most exciting, satisfying, awe-inspiring creativity comes from. So I always get excited to hear about things like that. So I had cart before the horse yet again, and it's because we're (laughs) going to move over to the live chat now. And as some of you might expect, there are some Power Rangers questions in the mix. So let's take this one from Steve Calderon here. He wrote... Thoughts on Dacre Montgomery confirming that Power Rangers will be rebooted with a new cast, canceling the sequel to the 2017 movie before I just like word vomit all over the desk. I'll let you guys go first. How do you feel about Power Rangers 2017 and it not getting a sequel? I'm a little bummed. I am not the biggest Power Rangers yeah. fan. I never really watched it as a kid. I had lots of friends that did. That it just, really surprises me, actually. I never, I never got into it. Um, huh. I was much more into Sailor Moon and Pokemon myself. I, I would bet on that. Yeah. <laughs> I was genuinely surprised by how much I liked the 2017 movie, though, mm-hmm. and uh, specifically for its character development. It, it has a, a really, really solid cast. It has some pretty terrible uh, visual effects, uh, and it has kind of a silly ending, but it feels like the core of, of something of, of sizable quality is there. It seems sort of a shame to throw that out, especially now that we have like Naomi Scott starring in, in Aladdin. Um, uh, what's his face uh, from Stranger Things? Uh, Dacre uh, Montgomery. Yeah. Lin, Lin is, is supposedly yeah. mm-hmm. in the running to play Shang-Chi. It just seems like surely you have these actors to a contract and they're all becoming very famous. I think that was the most surprising thing. It's like, I'm just surprised that they weren't contractually obligated to continue on with the franchise. But then again, yeah. And also I like, I don't really know what, uh, what Hasbro's plans are Mm -hmm. and Paramount with their cinematic universe that they're building. So the fact that that was a Lionsgate movie might complicate things. So, I guess I can see the behind the scenes reasons why they would have to let that cast loose. It, it's I'm also like, entirely possible there's stuff we just don't know about that, that Marvel is saying we want Ludi Lin for Shang-Chi and we're going to pay for whatever right. fee it has to be paid. And I guess the second you don't have one of them, you can't do any of them at that point. But I, I would agree that like, I, you know, I enjoyed that movie, not having a lot of nostalgia built around it other than friends dressing up as it for Halloween when I was a kid. <laughs> but the one thing that really did work was the cast for me. Like I thought their performances... 
made me care about those characters uh, as much as the movie tried to make me care about Krispy Kreme. And so, <laughs> like, yeah, you think that's that's the thing that did work, and there were a lot of other elements that didn't necessarily work. Perry, it seems like I was ve- I was very <laughs> everyone out there knows I was very very happy with that movie. That was, yeah. that show, Mighty Morphin, was a big part of my childhood, and I really just enjoyed the fact that that movie captured the spirit of the show while also modernizing it to a point from a technical perspective and also just story wise too I really took to what they started there and in particular like you bring up Silas I liked that ensemble a lot I think it is a shame that we got a taste of that group chemistry and all the potential there especially for Dean Israelite because I feel like this industry has not been fair to him so there's this movie that doesn't that doesn't pop as much as many suspected it might have and then on top of that I feel like Project Almanac got unfairly steamrolled that movie is a solid shaky cam movie and it did not get nearly as much love as I wanted it to. I love Project Almanac. I think I'm actually on the cover is my quote and it's like my favorite <laughs> quote on the cover because that movie is so, like, I like found footage movies but a lot of them are terrible and that one completely makes sense why they're filming. it. I think the time travel works yeah. really well. Uh I, I, I am happy to see what he does next. Yeah. I, I hope he has something lined up. I also hope whatever is brewing for the Power Rangers franchise, it gets okay. I'll get over it. Just make a good movie out of it. That's all I can ask for. That's it. We covered so much stuff today. Very quickly, let's do who's your favorite Power Ranger? What color? Oh, God. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Wait, which my one favorite speaks Sailor to you the most? Scout is uh, <laughs> Sailor Jupiter. Silas, what you got? I, I don't know if I have a favorite. Who's your favorite Sailor you Scout? You guys. Oh, uh, that's... I'm, <laughs> or I'm, maybe... I, I, I never really watched Sailor Moon either. What show were you watching when you were growing In up? In the 90s, Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I always have to go with the Blue Ranger. There's always something that spoke to me about that character, kind of like the nerdy side, but plus the physical side. Wait, how about this? Which Rangers would we be? Hmm. This, no, no, this is this is hard now. <laughs> I don't know enough about it. I feel like you're team blue with me. You're team blue. And like you got so much pep and energy. I have to go pink. All right, I'll take I it. I really like that. Okay, now that we've settled all that, we're done for the day. <laughs> That's the end of a week's worth of movie talk. Don't worry, we, we will be back Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And then I think we're coming at you from San Diego Comic-Con on Thursday. So brace yourself for that and so much Comic-Con coverage across the board. Terry, Silas, thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Cody in the booth, thank you so much for your hard work. And Dorian in the live chat to you as well. To everybody out there, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please do not leave without liking and sharing this video. And then tune back in 3 p.m. PT Live for a brand new episode of Movie Talk.